There are plenty of language nerds who know a lot of things about many languages, but there's also a huge group of people who don't know much about really any language. They may know that hola means hello in Spanish, or know a random phrase in another language. Even most Americans know that pizdiets means how are you in Russian. But even out of those who know nothing about linguistics, they could probably name a good handful of languages. Most people know about the big ones. English, Chinese, Japanese, Spanish, French, Russian, and even for other languages, it's often a matter of knowing which country or ethnic group speak a given language to know of their language. In Greece, they speak Greek, Swedes speak Swedish, and people from Samoa speak Samoan. While the major world languages have hundreds of millions of speakers, some other languages people have heard of don't have nearly as many speakers. Greek has about 13 million speakers, Swedish has at least 10 million, Samoan just 500,000. Compare this to the Gujarati language, which I'm willing to bet a lot of people watching haven't ever heard of, especially those unfamiliar with India and the many ethno-linguistic groups that live there. Want to know how many speakers it has? 60 million. And Gujarati is just one of several rarely talked about languages that has millions upon millions of people who speak it. Even among language enthusiasts who know of languages like Gujarati, they may not actually know that much about them. And today, I want to shine a light on 10 of the most spoken languages that you may have never heard of. The languages on this list are incredibly interesting and gigachad, so maybe you should consider learning them, especially if you're a monolingual beta. First up, we have Amharic. It's spoken in Ethiopia, primarily in the Amhara region by the Amhara people, but is also used as a lingua franca in major cities and towns throughout the country. It's also a Semitic language, being the second most spoken of them behind Arabic. With regards to phonology, Amharic has a handful of ejective consonants and has seven vowels, a, e, i, o, u, a, n, i, and has many words with doubled consonants in them. Amharic is written with the Gi'i script, an Abu Gita. What the heck is an Abu Gita? Abu Gidas, also known as alpha syllabaries, are writing systems that have a base consonant, usually with an inherent vowel, and diacritics that can be added around the consonant to mark a vowel sound to form a syllable. This character is la, this is li, this is lu, this is le, and so on. Each of these syllable graphemes are referred to as fidel in Amharic. Heads up, there are going to be a lot of Abu Gidas in this video. Moving on to grammar, Amharic's word order is SOV, subject object verb, and its nouns are either grammatically masculine or feminine. Amharic verbs sometimes have separate roots depending on if they're in the perfective or imperfective aspect, conjugating for various other things, and they have pronoun suffixes, changing whether the person is the subject of the verb, a direct object, a benefactive, and possessive suffixes get attached to nouns. Amharic marks words with a definite article suffix, equivalent to the in English. There's also a definite object suffix, but indefinite objects are usually left unmarked. Amharic has an implicit plural suffix, but singular nouns can also be used with plural meaning. Next up is Kannada. No, Kannada is not native to Canada. It's spoken by the Kanadiga in the southern Indian state of Karnataka, which includes Bangalore, the third largest city in India and the largest in the south part of the country. Kannada is a part of the Dravidian language family, spoken on the Indian subcontinent. Kannada has written records dating all the way back to the first century, has lots of extensive and important literature, and is designated as a classical language by the Indian government. Kannada's consonants are typical for a language of the Indian subcontinent, with lots of consonant doubling, a four-way distinction for stops, voiceless, aspirated, voiced, and breathy voiced, and there's a series of retroflex consonants. The vast majority of words end in vowels, and like other Dravidian languages, it has ten of them, with short and long versions of a, e, i, o, and u, the short versions of the vowels tend to be pronounced as reduced a, e, u, e, o, respectively. The language is written with the Kannada script, another Abu Gita. It has many letters meant to transcribe sounds from Sanskrit, which had a massive influence on the language, even being where those aspirated and breathy voice plosives came from. Indic scripts like Kannada employ something called conjuncts, which are combinations of two or more consonant letters that signify consonant clusters, since otherwise they'd be pronounced with a vowel in between. You may know about this letter, ta. It's used in this emoticon, the look of disapproval. Kannada's word order is SOV, and its grammar is largely agglutinative. It has three grammatical genders, masculine, feminine, and neuter, and there are about seven cases, with a singular and plural distinction for nouns as well. Verbs in Kannada inflect for the past, present, and future tenses, as well as a contingent future tense, for things that perhaps might happen. There's also a negative form of verbs, which doesn't inflect for tense. These words are formed from one of several verbal participles, which then have pronoun suffixes attached, which agree for the subject of the sentence. 
As mentioned earlier, Sanskrit, the prominent literary and liturgical language of India, has had a heavy influence on Kannada and many other languages of India, and a large portion of Kannada vocabulary comes from it. Next on the list we have Javanese. Not to be confused with Java, the programming language. Javanese is spoken on the island of Java in Indonesia, primarily on the eastern and central parts, but is also spoken by ethnic Javanese people all across Indonesia. It is the Austronesian language with the highest number of native speakers, though most of its speakers can also speak Indonesian. Nowadays, Javanese is primarily written using the Latin alphabet, but it also has its own writing system, the Javanese script, not to be confused with JavaScript. It's an abugida, with lots of letters for Sanskrit sounds despite not really using all of them, and it just looks really fancy and stylish. Even its punctuation looks pretty. Javanese has six vowels, a, e, i, o, u, and a, with a being pronounced o at the end of words or before another o, so the word for Java is actually pronounced jowo. It lacks regular voice consonants, instead they're slack voiced, with the following vowels gaining breathy voice. The word order is usually SVO, and Javanese lacks grammatical tense and number. It can be considered to fall under the topic comment model, where sentences have a topic, the main thing being talked about in the sentence, and the comment, which describes it. An example would be the sentence, they came to the temple, where they is the topic, and came to the temple is the comment. In the sky is blue, the sky is the topic, and is blue is the comment. This dichotomy can also be found in Japanese and Korean. You may be wondering, what's the difference between a topic and a subject? That's a great question! That would be better answered by Japanese and Korean learning channels. Javanese also features politeness, where the formality of the situation heavily affects speech. There are three levels for politeness. Ngoko when talking to someone of similar or lower status. Krama is used in formal situations and with people of higher status. And Madhya is between the two, used with strangers. These politeness levels usually affect the vocabulary used, with some words being more polite and formal than others. There is a large amount of Sanskrit loanwords in Javanese, particularly in poetic texts, and in Krama or Madhya speech. It has possessive suffixes, used when a specific pronoun is possessing a noun, like my or your. There are a handful of derivational suffixes, and Javanese features lots of reduplication in various contexts. Using it to mark nouns as explicitly plural, turn adjectives into nouns, and reduplicated verbs indicate that the action is repeated. Going back to Africa, there's Hausa, spoken primarily in northern Nigeria and southern Niger, and is the most spoken native African language in their respective countries. Hausa is a part of the Afroasiatic language family, much like the Semitic languages in ancient Egyptian, and within Afroasiatic, Hausa is specifically a part of the Chadic branch. This makes Hausa a certified GigaChad language, so learning it may make you attractive to every woman and man on the planet. Hausa has a handful of ejective consonants, as well as two voice implosives, similar to ejectives but corresponding to voice sounds. It has a set of labiovelar stops, it contrasts palatal stops with alveolar affricates, has a distinction between alveolar trill r and retroflex tap r, and has a distinction between a regular y and a rare pregaudalized y. It has the five vowel system with a length distinction, and Hausa is also a tonal language. It has a high tone, a low tone, and a falling tone. The falling tone can only occur on long vowels, or on diphthongs, of which Hausa has four, i, au, u, and ui. While previously written with an Arabic-derived alphabet called ajami, today the Latin alphabet is usually used, known as boko. It has letters with hooks to mark implosives and ejective k, with r tilde used for r. It uses diacritics to mark vowel length and tone, but these are usually left unwritten. House's grammar is quite unique. The plural form of nouns is highly unpredictable, with a whole 20 different ways of making a noun plural. Hausa has a grammatical gender distinction between masculine and feminine, with masculine nouns taking the suffix na when possessed by another noun, and feminine nouns take the suffix r. Pronouns in Hausa change depending on if the pronoun is in the accusative case, dative case, is a genitive suffix, or as an independent pronoun. But pronouns serve another grammatical function. Instead of marking its various tenses, aspects, and moods on the verb, those instead get marked on the subject pronouns. This is somewhat similar to English where we have contractions like al and yud, which include grammatical meaning within the pronoun, but Hausa takes this idea to its logical extreme. Verbs instead change based on the object of the sentence, changing depending on if it's a direct object, indirect object, pronoun object, or if the sentence has none. Next up is Wu Chinese, spoken primarily in the Jiangsu and Zhejiang provinces of China, including Shanghai and Suzhou. 
Wu Chinese is less of a language and more so a dialect group, representing various trends of changes that occurred when these varieties evolved from Middle Chinese. While Shanghainese, spoken in Shanghai, is the most well-known Wu variety, and while it'll be the main one I talk about, I must stress that not all Wu Chinese is the same as Shanghainese. Not every Wu Chinese variety is mutually intelligible either. Speakers of dialects in the main Taihu cluster can mostly understand each other, including Suzhounese and Shanghainese, but speakers of the southern clusters have lower mutual intelligibility with each other. The phonology has a distinction between aspirated and unaspirated stops and affricates, and it also has a voicing distinction for all obstruents, a distinction that was lost in most other varieties of Chinese. Shanghainese has three tones in unchecked syllables, and two tones in checked ones, which is less tones than in most other varieties of Chinese. While tones are fully pronounced in monosyllabic words, the tone gets spread out across polysyllabic ones, with the tone of one of the syllables determining the tone of the whole word, and the other syllables have their tones neutralized. The Wu varieties are characterized by their huge number of vowel qualities. The Jianhui dialect, for example, has a whole 20 of them. Wu varieties also have syllabic consonants, which are consonants that make up the entirety of a syllable. The only coda phonemes in Shanghainese are a nasal coda and the glottal stop. And this combined with the fewer amount of tones makes it so that Shanghainese and other Wu varieties have the fewest distinct syllables out of all Chinese varieties, causing a greater number of homophones and polysyllabic words. Wu is written using Chinese characters, although the various varieties of Wu are mostly used only in colloquial speech, and when writing, standard written Chinese is usually used instead. Often individual Chinese characters will have a literary pronunciation in Wu for formal situations and a different colloquial reading for casual speech. The grammar is typical of Chinese. Sentences are analytical, there's a lack of tense, but a lot of particles marking aspect. Wu Chinese also has many counterwords, which are paired with words when they take either a number or a demonstrative pronoun. Wu Chinese was also the basis for go on readings of Japanese kanji, and while kanon readings are more common, these readings are still the basis of many Japanese words used to this day. The one Chinese variety of Wu has an interesting reputation, being referred to as the devil tongue for its particularly strange sound. In the same vein as Navajo, the Chinese used it for secret military code during World War II. There's a phrase in China that goes, fear not the heavens, fear not the earth, but fear the person from Wanzhou speaking Wanzhounese. Moving on, it's Tamil time. It's another Dravidian language spoken in the southern Indian state of Tamil Nadu, and by a minority in Sri Lanka, as well as communities in Singapore and Malaysia. Tamil has a basic 10 vowel system, 5 short, 5 long, but unlike most other languages of the Indian subcontinent, it lacks distinctions with either voicing or aspiration. It also lacks phonemic fricatives in native words, with only a few marginal phonemes that appear in loanwords. The stop phonemes have a lot of allophony, and in some situations are pronounced as voice plosives or as fricatives. Tamil is also very liquid heavy, with two L-like sounds and three R-like sounds. Unlike other languages in the Dravidian family like Kannada and Telugu, Tamil has words that end in consonants much more often. Tamil is one of the earliest written languages in the world that is still spoken today, with a rich literary tradition behind it. Interestingly, the Tamil script was originally written onto leaves, and the script today is characterized by many squiggles juxtaposed with straight lines. The Tamil script is yet another abugida, and it actually has one of the fewest amounts of consonants of any Brahmic script, due to not having a bunch of extra consonants for voice and aspirated consonants in sounds that only appear in Sanskrit. Since written Tamil is so old, the standard written form of Tamil is drastically different from the various spoken dialects, in a case very similar to diglossia. This also applies to Kannada and Telugu to a certain extent, which also has very old written histories. The grammar has many typical traits for a Dravidian language, grammatical gender, personal agreement on verbs, and tense aspect and mood marking. Tamil has a handful of grammatical cases, but the exact number is hard to pinpoint because of all the variation in the system, case forms that have fallen out of use, and disagreements on whether a morpheme is a case or a normal postposition. Tamil can express evidentiality, such as with the suffix am, which marks that the speaker learned the information through hearsay. Tamil forms relative clauses, equivalent to English that, by putting a conjugated verb right before a modified noun. So, the boy that came literally translates as he came boy, and the table that the girl made translates as girl she made table. Tamil is considered to be the major Dravidian language that was least influenced by Sanskrit, with most vocabulary being of native Dravidian origin. Now for a word from today's sponsor, the Telugu language. That was a joke, this video isn't actually sponsored. Telugu is another Dravidian language, spoken in the South Indian states of Andhra Pradesh and Telangana. 
and is also designated as a classical language alongside Kannada and Tamil. Telugu phonology is pretty standard for a Dravidian language, with 10 vowels, a native voicing distinction, aspirated sounds found in Sanskrit loanwords, and lots of geminated consonants. Sa is the only fricative native to Telugu, and it has the native consonants tsa and za present. The vast majority of Telugu words have purely open syllables, more so than the other Dravidian languages. The Telugu script is also very typical for an Indic Brahmi derived script, but personally Telugu is one of my favorites, with how neat and aesthetic it looks. The grammar of Telugu is also defined by grammatical case, personal agreement, and agglutination. A lot of Telugu words will end with u. Verb infinitives end in it, pronoun suffixes end in it, and most nouns in the nominative case end in u too. Du is the usual masculine suffix, alu is a feminine suffix, amu is a common neuter suffix, and the vast majority of plural nouns end with lu. Telugu has a distinction between inclusive and exclusive we. The inclusive includes both the speaker and the listener, while the exclusive excludes the listener and only refers to the speaker and some third person or people. There are also a wide array of third person pronouns, which can change based on formality, plurality, gender, and even distance, changing whether the person or thing the pronoun refers to is here or there. Telugu vocabulary has also been extensively influenced by Sanskrit, to the point where some estimates put the percentage of words coming from Sanskrit as high as 80%. It likely doesn't reach as high as 80% in normal conversations though, as much of the Sanskrit vocabulary is used for formal, literary, and or technical language. Marathi is up next. It's spoken in the Indian state of Maharashtra, which includes Mumbai. Marathi is a part of the Indo-Aryan language family, much like Hindi and Bengali, which all descended from Prakrits, vernacular varieties of Sanskrit, with Marathi in particular descending from the Maharashtri Prakrit. All these Indo-Aryan languages are a part of the greater Indo-European macro family. Marathi has six vowels, a, e, i, o, u, and a. Being descended from Sanskrit, there are aspirated and breathy voice sounds in native words. It has a distinction between alveolar la and retroflex la, a set of alveolar affricates and various breathy sonorants. Marathi is written with Devanagari, the same abugida as Hindi, Nepali, and the most used script for Sanskrit. The version Marathi uses is called Balbod. And while similar to other versions of Devanagari, it has a few differences, including a distinct letter to represent alveolar lateral la. These two letters, which are pronounced a and o in Hindi, are pronounced i and o in Marathi, more similar to the Sanskrit pronunciation. Like North Indian languages, Marathi has SOV word order and it has three grammatical genders, masculine, feminine, and neuter, which were present in Sanskrit, but the neuter gender has been lost in various other Indo-Aryan languages. Marathi has two classes of adjectives, declinable and undeclinable, with declinable ones agreeing with the nouns they modify in gender, number, and case, while undeclinable adjectives don't change form. Marathi is a split ergative language. Ergativity can be a bit tricky to understand, but in a nutshell, instead of having the subject of sentences with transitive verbs be the unmarked default and having the object marked, in ergative languages, the object is the default and the subject is marked with the ergative case, as it is in Marathi. This only happens in the past tense and the obligatory mood, and the rest of Marathi sentences don't mark the subject as ergative. Marathi also has a distinction between inclusive and exclusive we, and there are various noun cases in many postpositions. Verbs in Marathi have a past, present, future tense distinction, along with personal pronoun agreement. Finally rounding out all the South Asian languages is Punjabi. Punjabi is another Indo-Aryan language, and is spoken in the Punjab region, spanning the Pakistani province of Punjab and the Indian state also called Punjab. While the Punjabi language is associated with Sikhs and Sikhism by some, the majority of speakers are actually Muslim and live in Pakistan, where it is the most spoken native language. Punjabi has 10 vowels, a, a, i, i, u, u, e, e, o, and o. Punjabi's consonants are fairly similar to Hindi and Urdu, but it also has a distinction of being one of the few Indo-European languages that are tonal. It has three tones, high falling, low rising, and level, the latter of which is by far the most common. Tones arose after the breathy voice consonants, which shifted to plain stops at the beginning of words and unaspirated voice stops elsewhere. The amount of double consonants is also notably larger in Punjabi than in other Indo-Aryan languages. In India, Punjabi is written using Gurmukhi, a typical Indic Abugida, and in Pakistan it's written with Shakmukhi, which is an adaptation of the Arabic script, or specifically the Persian version, adapted to fit Punjabi. Grammatically speaking, third-person pronouns are the same as demonstrative pronouns this and that. They don't change based on the gender of the referent, but they do agree for distance. Verbs conjugate for aspect and mood, 
and can be made to agree for either the gender and or for person. Punjabi has about 5 cases, give or take, and like Marathi, has postpositions that serve as markers for various other cases. The last language on this list, the most spoken language that most people haven't heard of, is Nigerian Pidgin, otherwise known as Nija. Hey, whoa, slow down, I've heard of Nigerian Pidgin. It's spoken in Nigeria, naturally, and it's an English-based Creole language spoken by millions upon millions of people all across the country. This is not the same as Nigerian English, which is much more similar to the other standard versions of English and is primarily spoken in formal situations like business and politics. Although it's called a Nigerian Pidgin, it's more accurate to call it a Creole, as it has surpassed the functions of a normal Pidgin language. Nija is what it's called within the language, which also means Nigeria, but don't call it Nija with both syllables in the low tone because that means Niger. Nija has two tones, high and low, with most syllables being low tone, and only a dozen or so words distinguished only by tone. This pairs with the fact that many of the major languages of Nigeria are tonal, including Yoruba, Igbo, and Hausa. A lot of Nija is similar to English, but also has many influence and traits from the various languages of Nigeria. As mentioned, there are tones, as well as the gba and kba sounds, as there are in Igbo and Yoruba. But there are no dental fricatives, as they are very rare in the region. English's however many vowels are whittled down to seven, the same seven vowels present in Yoruba in Edo. Likewise, about 65% of the vocabulary is of English origin, but many words also come from Yoruba, Igbo, Edo, and Hausa, and even a few from Portuguese back from when they traded in the region. The word order and grammar is also very similar to English, but with differences here and there. Take the sentence, I see somebody, but him no see anybody, which means I saw someone, but they didn't see anyone, where all the words have a resemblance to English, but are also a bit different. Instead of having the suffix su for the plural and possessive like in English, Nija has the particle dem to mark plurality, and it uses the suffix im for possession. Various words of English origin have altered meaning, like the word go, which comes from English go, but it marks the future tense on top of meaning to go when used with the high tone. It's quite fun to look at descriptions of Nija as an English speaker and see what similarities and differences there are. And it's easy to pick up a few words and phrases, thanks to how similar many words are and how simple the grammar is. And those were 10 of the most spoken languages that most people haven't heard of. I hope this video helped you better understand some languages that don't get talked about nearly as often as others. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Only monolingual betas are not subscribed to Lingo Lizard. I would love to say goodbye in all of these languages, but I struggle to find reliable translations, and apparently people don't really say bye in Tamil or Telugu, so I'm only going to do it for a few languages. Dachnahunu, Sugang Tinta, Sayanjima, and Sehwe.